Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, which I will confess is gonna be a little on the longer side, we're going to trace the flow of data through our application. Um, and you know, regardless of what you're working on, doing this is frequently a very, very useful way to understand how a particular application works is to you know trace the flow of code but also trace the flow of data think about you know what am i seeing what's the data that i'm seeing on the screen where does that data come from how did it get to this point in the program um, so to help us with that i'm going to fire up uh, the emulator uh, because i want to start at the top so here's how we're going to do this we're going to start at the top uh, we're going to look at the data that we can see when the app runs We'll talk a little bit about why that data is there and sort of where it came from or, or how it got onto the screen. Then we'll dive all the way to the very, very bottom and we'll look at where the data came from in the first place. And then we'll go step by step as we walk up from the server back to our client, back to the screen and talking about various aspects of how the data moves at various points of the program. So again, sit back, you know, maybe put this on like 2x or whatever. Um, and here we go. Okay, so when we fire up our app, you can see on the screen that there's data there, right? Not only is there a map, but in particular, there are these uh, markers on the map. Now I've completed MP0, so this is starting up centered in that special place. Um, but one of the things we'll notice right away is when I click on these markers, something is wrong. Like there is a box, a bubble that's being shown, but there's no content in that bubble. And so that is also something that we'll have an opportunity to do as we go along in this lesson is fix this. And that will allow you to pass the first test case for MP1. Um, all right, so uh, let's start in main activity, KT. Um, and why are these, why are there markers on the map? There are markers on the map because of this piece of code called update shown places. Now you'll see that update showed places is past a list of places. And if I go to the definition of this place, this is in my models.kt file, this is just a normal Kotlin class with a few properties. There's an ID, there's a name, there's a latitude and longitude because these correspond to places on earth that are doubles, and then a description. And the name is the name of the person who contributed this particular favorite place. The ID is a unique identifier that allows us to distinguish between them. This is part of the data set. Whenever you're working with data, it can be really helpful sometimes to give each piece of data a unique ID and then maintain that because you know you might have like two favorite places with the same description or the same exactly the same location. Um, and having a unique identifier allows us to keep them separate. And the, the unique identifiers that we're using are something called a UUID. We'll see them in the data in a minute. Um, so how is this being used in show in, in update shown places? And I'll, I'll you know you can go through this. This is pretty well commented. But let's look at a couple of places where properties of each place are being used. So I've got a loop here. I'm going through all the places that were passed to the method. I create a marker. That's actually this thing. This is a component that's provided by OSM Droid, which is the mapping library that we're using to support this project. Um, I set the marker's ID to the ID of the place, uh, you know, and again, this is another place where you see the use of this unique ID. The markers actually allow you to set unique IDs. And then I set its position appropriately. So every place has a latitude and a longitude. And in order to make sure the marker appears at the right spot on the map, I make sure that the marker's position is set properly. And this geo point is something that you might have used in MP0, but essentially just brings together lat long, right? This is a, a point on the geo. Um, then I set the title. Now this is a little confusing because in OSM Droid, the title is what's shown in this pop-up when I click on it. And so clearly there's something wrong here and I could put in some tracing, but I'm gonna skip it at this point. But clearly once we get to this point, the description of the place is blank or null maybe even, but I don't think it's nullable. Um, so it's blank. So something has gone wrong um, on the data path. And again, part of your uh, goal for the first part of MP1 is to fix that. Um, okay, so that's why the markers, th this is sort of like how the data manifests. Like you see it on the screen, you see these markers because we created a marker object and we set it in the right position. But where did this data come from in the first place and how did it get here? So let's go all the way down to the very, very bottom and talk about the source of the data that's used by this app. And that actually is in a CSV file here in the resources directory. So again, I'm always in the project view. I'm gonna open up this file. Now this is a file in a format called CSV, comma separated values. 
This is one of many different ways of essentially taking data and allowing us to store it in a file as a string. Um, we're going to look at another way to do that that's covered a little bit more in the lesson in a few minutes. Um, but this is the data that we provided and this is why there are, you know, I don't know, 59 places on the map, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's two lines up here. Um, this one is a hash that we use to make sure that you haven't modified this file. In the past, we had students modify the CSV and then all sorts of weird things happen and be very difficult to debug. So this will help with that. Um, there's a header. And you'll see that these are the fields in the CSV that are separated by commas. They're also surrounded by quotes. So this is a unique ID. This is one of those UUIDs I talked about. It's a particular format of unique ID. This is the person who contributed the favorite place. This is the lat long. And then this is a description that was provided by that person of this place and why they think it's so cool. Um, and you'll notice that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between these um, the, the fields in the CSV, this header, and the properties on my place object. So I've got an ID, a name, a lat long, and a description. And in the data, I've got an ID, a name, a lat long, and a description. So, and, and this is very common. Frequently when we're working with data in our program, we kind of get a sense of like what the data looks like. And then we build a model to allow us to store all the information um, about that piece of data in an in-memory object that we can then pass around and use, for example, to put, make sure the markers are in the right spot. Okay, cool. So now we're gonna work our way up. So the question is, what happens to the CSV file? It's included as part of your project, but where does it get used? And it gets used by the server. So I'm gonna open up server.kt. Now, before we start talking about this, I just wanna kind of remind you about one of the interesting features of this particular application, which is that it really has two very distinct parts. There's the server, and really all the server code is in this one file called server.kt. Everything else is your client. This is your app. Now, normally when you run an app, like if I was gonna deploy this for real, I would, the app would look very similar, but the server would live in the cloud or on running on some server in a data center somewhere or wherever. Like when you interact with our 124 materials, you're interacting with a series of servers that I've set up and maintained that are located in some data center on campus. To be honest, I have no idea even where they are, but they're out there and I have access to them and we use that to support uh, your work in the course. Similarly, whenever you use apps on your phone, 99.9% .9 of the time they're talking to some server uh, somewhere in the cloud. And that's why frequently if you turn off the network, they don't work as well or they, uh, they have degraded functionality because they can't talk to the server over the internet that they need to communicate with. Now for this project, we put everything into one place for you to allow you to do something that's called full stack app development. So you get to work on the server and you get to work on the client. But it's just a little unusual to have them all smooshed into one place. Usually the server runs one place, the client runs somewhere else. But I want to make this clear as we start tracing because what we're going to find out quickly is that there's no direct code flow path that starts from the app that leads directly into the server. Instead, the app and the server are communicating over the internet basically the same way they would be if the server was running in the cloud or on some machine that was far away from the device that I was running the app on, right? which is the normal way things work. All right, so where is the places.csv used in the server? So I'm going to scroll down. Uh, of course, I know where it is. Um, well, actually, I thought I knew where it is. Here it is, load places. So this is a method that returns a list of places. And, um, you know, it, there, there is this pretty, <laughs> pretty ugly piece of code required to load that CSV into a string. That has a little bit to do with, you know, how Java works. And again, you know, you can read the commentary here. Um, and then, so now essentially input is, this, is a string that contains all of the content from the CSV, including the new lines and everything. And now we're gonna parse this using the CSV library. We're using a CSV library called OpenCSV. CSV is simple enough that a lot of times people think they can get away with parsing it on their own, but I wouldn't. You know, there are people out there who maintain great libraries for this purpose, just use them and they'll work better. And actually there are some subtleties to parsing CSV. Um, so what we do, and this is you know code that was in the documentation for the library, we create this uh, CSV reader, we tell it to skip the first two lines because we don't want to include the hash, we don't want to include the header. Um, and then what it gives us is it gives us something that we can iterate over. And what parts is actually is a string array. 
So it's an array of strings. This is a little confusing, but essentially it's an array of strings, almost like you would get from split, where each, um, each index in the array includes part of that part of what was in places.csv. So let's put in a little bit of uh, uh, print len here just so we can see this at work, right? So parts zero. So what's the first thing that's in the CSV? That's this ID. So when I put this in here and rerun the app, I'll have to open up Logcat so that I can see what's going on and then look at system.out. Uh, there it is. What do I expect to see? I see all the IDs from the CSV file, right? It's just being printed out one by one. If I change this to be one, you'll see now I'm gonna see a list of all the people. Remember the name is the name of the person who contributed to this. So, you know, my uh, colleague Maddox contributed some data. Um, I contributed data, uh, you know, Colleen Lewis, uh, Elsa, a bunch of my colleagues in the CS department as well as, well as a bunch of uh, CS124 staff. And actually one of the cool things about this app, once you get the description to show is that you can find cool places on campus that you never knew about. Uh, particularly if you're new to the area, I was actually uh, really excited to visit some of the spots that I learned about from, you know, kind of creating this app and from getting contributions from my colleagues and from people on staff. So anyway, um, maybe at some point we'll do like a competition to see who can go to all these spots. Um, all right, so I'm going to take this out so you just have some idea of what's going on here. And what I'm doing is I'm just using the place constructor to create a place um, and I'm passing it the parts of the CSV as appropriate. And because, you know, I am a good person, I've laid everything out really nicely. There's a few places where I need to do conversions. So everything in here is a string, but there's a few places where I know that this is numeric data. And so I use this two double method to convert it into a double. Otherwise, this is how this works. Okay, so we started with the CSV and now we've essentially uh, created a list of place objects. This process is known as deserialization. So deserialization takes a string or the contents of a file and creates a set of objects, you know, a set of in-memory objects. So what we've done is we took this thing that was a string and by observing some conventions, we were able to convert each line in that string, each line from that file to a new place and then we return that list of places. Now, where does this get used is the next question. Um, and if I just look this up, I can see that when the server starts up, um, it loads the list of places. And I think this is done on a reset. It's also uh, done right here, right? So when the server starts up, it loads a list of places and saves it into a private variable. Now, where is this used? So now we get to talk about the communication between the client and the server. So at this point, the server, which again, normally would be running on some other computer, has loaded the list of places from the CSV file and has them in memory. But how does it get them to the client? So the first thing the client has to do is ask. And this proto the, the, the way that the client asks for this data is using a protocol called HTTP. Now, if you're wondering like, where have I heard of HTTP before? You've heard of HTTP before, and I'm gonna show you where you've heard of HTTP. HTTP is the protocol that is used by web browsers to request information from a web server. And so what I can do here, let me close this so the emulator gets a bit bigger. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this. I'm gonna open up Chrome. And you'll see that I was doing this for the other walkthroughs. So I'm gonna load, I'm gonna to go to this address. So this is localhost 8989. That's a server running on this device slash places. So where does that come from? So if I go over here to the application, you'll see that I have configured the server to run on this particular port. I wanna get into that, but that's where the 898 comes from. And then localhost means talk to a server on this device. And you'll see if I go to localhost places, what I get back from the server is data. Now, what's the format of this data? This data is in a format called JSON. JSON is a different way of serializing and deserializing information. So there's one way, which is you take data and you convert it to a CSV where everything is separated by a comma. JSON is different and there's more information on this lesson about JSON. So I'm not gonna talk about it in detail in, in length here. Where is this happening? So if I go back to the server, you'll see that when I get a request for this route called places, and we'll come back and talk about the networking code more later. So don't worry if, if this is all going a little quickly. Um, when I get a request for this places route and the client is asking for data using what's called a get request, I return the result of calling get places. What does get places do? 
Um, it returns in the body of the response the result of using a library called Jackson to serialize places. So places is this list of place objects that's stored in memory. Remember, I got that from deserializing data from the CSV. Now I'm going to serialize it again, but I'm serializing it using a data format called JSON. And that's what comes out here. So if you were, and, and sometimes actually, if you poke around on the internet, you can actually find API endpoints that will return data like this. So you may have gone to something that you thought was a web page and seen something like that, what was going on, and it's actually something that's used internally by an application to retrieve data from the server. It's not something you're really supposed to look at in your web browser, but you can. Okay, so now I know kind of where the data is, something a little bit about where the data is coming from. So what would happen normally is the client starts up on your phone. When it starts up, it asks the server for this data, and this data is transmitted over the internet. And so that's this break between these two components of our app. So we've talked about everything we can about the server. Now let's talk about the client. So essentially, now we're gonna to go to the other side of the request on the internet. What made this request? So the request was made over here in client.kt. There's this method called get places. And what it does, and again, there's a lot of commentary here, and this is code that will work with more in MP2. It makes a request to the server. It uses the get protocol, which is normally used to retrieve data. It makes a request to slash places, which is the same URL that I have over here. And when the request completes, the response, which is a string, let's print it and see what happens. So I'm gonna print the result of calling. So essentially this has made the request. And then when it completes, this callback runs, or this, this uh, function runs, and let's run the app again. We'll restart it. Um, and now what I'm going to expect to see in my logcat output is this string. And this is a long string. It's not formatted very well. But this is the same data that I was just looking at in the browser. It's just formatted a little more poorly. But this is the same places data set now serialized in JSON. Um, so it was only giving you kind of a, a couple of different flavors of serialization, but, and you might be thinking like, wow, this is making my head spin. So I had data as a file called places.csv. I deserialized it into a list of places that was stored in server's memory. Then when the client asked for it, I reserialized it into JSON, transmitted over the internet. Now, of course, what's going to happen next? Well, I have a string, but what does the client really want? The client wants a list of places just like the server had. And so it is also going to use Jackson, that JSON library that we use, to deserialize the data back into a list of places. And so this is what happens right here. Places is a list of places, assuming that this read value uh, returns properly. And this is how we use Jackson to take a string and deserialize it back into a list of place objects that live in memory. Now, where do those end up? Those get passed back to our main activity. When the main activity starts up, it calls get places, and it provides itself as a callback. Callbacks are something we'll talk more about uh, for the UI very soon, and then for networking when we come back to MP2. Um, but this is essentially how the data makes its way back to the main activity. Once the client makes that request and the request completes, this method gets called. It gets passed a list of places wrapped inside this result might throw object that we use to make sure that we can also return errors as appropriate. We retrieve the list of places and then we call update shown places. So that in a nutshell in, I don't know, I'm, I'm timing this to try to make sure that it's, well, I thought I was timing it, oops. Um, so that in, in a moderately large nutshell is how the data gets from the server all the way back to the client and then onto the screen. Is this unusual? No. Probably the most unusual thing about this actually is this CSV file. Normally, if you were doing this, so I actually have a, a web-based version of this that I use to collect the data. Normally, you would save data in an app like this in something called a database that would allow you to, you know, because I, I don't want it just hanging out in a file. I want to be able to do things like update it, remove things, add things, stuff like that. Um, and I, you typically don't store data in CSV on disk. You use a database. And that's something that you'll learn about in future courses. But other than that, this is a very realistic flow of data in this type of application. The data starts off, you know, in this case in the CSV or in a database, it's serialized so that it can be sent across the internet. That may be something that doesn't quite make sense to you, but the real thing to realize is that the data is stored in the server's memory. 
The client is a different computer. So I've got to get the data from the server's memory to the client's memory. The way that we do that is we use the internet, but usually in order to transmit the data across the internet, we serialize it to convert it into a string-based representation. That then gets transmitted across the internet and deserialized on the client. So the data starts in the server's memory, the server serializes it to a string, that string gets transmitted over the internet. I can't transmit memory directly over the internet, I can't transmit strings, the client reads the string and then converts it back to a list of places. And so in that way, I've taken that list of places from the server's memory and sent it to the client and now the client has it in its memory. Now, the cool thing about this is that this also works between different programming languages. So if my server was written in Python or you know, Go or Rust or uh, JavaScript, this would all work the same way, which is one of the things that's really cool about serialization. And one of the reasons that we use it is it produces something like JSON that pretty much every major programming language has support for, right? So that's another reason to, to serialize stuff. Okay, so to summarize, we've seen how data flows through our application. So it starts in the CSV file. That CSV file is read by the server when it starts up um, and then used, loaded into memory, and then used to respond to requests by the client or really by any web client. We issued a request using a web browser and we saw that that also worked, but any client can then request that data from a particular URL. What it gets back is JSON. The client then uses Jackson, which is the same library that we use to serialize the list of places to a string to deserialize, to undo that process, take the string, convert it back to a list of places, and then it passes that list of places back to the main activity, which uses them to update the UI. Now, obviously one of the cool things about this is, let's say later in the day, I go back to the app and open it up again, it can request the list of places again, and the server can respond with different data. So for example, if the main activity made a request, let's say that uh, later on, we're gonna show you how uh, in MP2, we're gonna walk through the process of adding a new favorite place to the data set. And what will happen is that after you do that, the client will ask for the list of favorite places from the server, and the server will have one more favorite place to return yours and that'll be part of the data set and the map will update so you can imagine like going back to the map later in the day maybe somebody's changed the description maybe somebody's moved their favorite place or deleted it or new people have contributed data whatever it, it all works okay so i know this was a little bit lengthy a little bit detailed um i hope it's fun though right i mean this is really a slice of how real apps work like every app you have on your phone communicates with I shouldn't say every, but 99.9% .9 of them communicate with some type of backend server that's stored in, that, that runs in the cloud somewhere. Many of them use JSON to exchange data. So if you could see the data they were passing back and forth, you'd see JSON very similar to what we just saw. Um, that's one of the reasons why if you turn off the network on your phone, there are a lot of apps will not work properly until you re-enable it because they've lost the ability to communicate with that backend server that they need to communicate with in order to work. So it's a little bit of a taste of the type of capabilities that you'll have in the future, in your future in computer science to build these apps that work with data, that transmit it across the internet, and that use essentially computation in multiple places, both on a server and on a client to enable these kind of cool experiences.